Hello everyone, I am Sammy, your devoted manga otaku, and welcome to my manga space. Today, I will be discussing all the manga I read in the month of May. I apologize that this video is coming out a little bit late. I had a bunch of personal stuff happen to me this month. My computer died and it was beyond repair, but I was lucky enough to get a new one pretty quickly. Uh, I also had a minor surgery this month. I'm fine. It wasn't anything serious. I thought being bedridden for a few days would be the perfect opportunity to read some manga, but I was wrong. <laughs> the pills I was taking made me sleep a lot, so I didn't want to commit to reading any big series. Fortunately, I was able to read some one-offs and some smaller series, so it wasn't a total loss. But with the rambling over, I invite you to grab a tea or other beverage of your choice and let's talk manga. So like last month, I'm going to start with the manga I enjoyed the least and work my way up to the manga I enjoyed the most. And I'll be attaching star ratings to the manga as well. I've added timestamps throughout this video, so feel free to jump around. I lucked out this month. I actually didn't read anything too terrible. If I've decided not to unhaul anything, it's a win in my books. <laughs> The first manga I'll mention is one that I thought I was for sure going to fall in love with. I kept talking about how excited I was to read it and how it received so many good reviews. I am of course talking about volumes 1 through 7 of the completed Jose series, An Incurable Case of Love by Maki and Joji. This romance drama series is published by Viz Media and it's rated M for Mature or 17 plus. I think I might have hyped this up a little too much, which is part of the reason why it was just kind of meh for me. This narrative follows Nanise Sakura, who's in her senior year of high school, when she watches a young doctor save an old woman's life. Inspired, Nanise dedicates the next five years of her life pursuing nursing so that she can get a job in the same hospital as her Prince Charming, aka Dr. Tendo. Only after Nanise meets Dr. Tendo and confesses her love for him is she able to see who he truly is, which is a harsh, mean workaholic. Nanise's dreams of love and marriage crumble into dust as she struggles to work alongside the unforgiving and demanding Dr. Tendo. I wrote a really harsh blurb about this manga on my Instagram, and I don't necessarily regret writing those things, but I wish I could have written a little bit more about the things that I liked about this manga. So before crapping all over it, I'm gonna start off with the things that I liked. I like in Joji Sensei's art style. I think she's really expressive and her characters are very proportionate and the clean lines are nice to look at. The panels are laid out well, everything is easy to follow, and the manga is easy to understand and read. The steamy scenes are great, and you'd know that if you've read any of Njoji Sensei's other manga. She has a knack for writing those scenes. Additionally, the manga did make me laugh and smile here and there, but that's where I draw the line when it comes to things that I really loved about this manga. Now, I wouldn't say I hated things about this series, but there is quite a bit of stuff that fell flat for me. The storyline is tropey and cliche, plot points and story arcs become so predictable that it started to become boring, like I've read the same story before. Now I could have easily forgiven this if there was something that set the story apart from other manga, and that's where I thought that the hospital that the hospital environment was going to come in. I thought we were going to watch this couple in a hectic hospital treating patients and working together in stressful situations while navigating a romantic relationship with each other. This is not that. <laughs> Most of the hospital and work scenes 
take place in an office away from patients or during the character's lunch breaks. There is almost zero medical jargon used in this and the only medical procedure that's mentioned and described is the process of giving someone an IV. All this manga taught me when it came to the medical field is that the hospital staff work long hours and doing an IV is hard and I already knew both of those things. So I guess I didn't really learn anything. <laughs> also, I did not care for the ending. There are so many cliches that were all incorporated into this ending and there was just nothing original about it. It was not great in my opinion. <laughs> The characters have nothing special really going for them. You have the Sundere, I hope I said that right. You have the Sundere male character, Dr. Tendo, who is actually a little unique in that he is way meaner than most Sundere characters I've read about. He is grumpy and miserable with everyone except his patients. And it's so bad that there's only a few nurses that will work for him. I like grumpy manga boys. You guys know this, but I disliked that his temperament didn't always have a meaning or a purpose. It was sometimes used to add turmoil or drama without an explanation. I keep making the joke that the only interesting thing about Dr. Tendo is that he's mean and he has a sweet tooth. And that's this character in a nutshell. Nanise was very annoying throughout the series in a basic high school shoujo heroine sort of way. She has this plucky, loud, and immature personality. She literally chose to be a nurse, not because she likes nursing or because she wants to be a nurse, but to confess her love to Dr. Tendo and live happily ever after. Five years of her life, dedicated to a man she has fallen in love with, but has never met. At least this poor life decision allows her character to grow, but all these character traits don't read like a Jose to me. It reads like a juvenile shoujo story. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think if you're going into this knowing that it's cliche, smutty, soap opera-y, <laughs> you'll be okay. I do like reading books like this too sometimes. I know that these kind of stories are popular. I just didn't go into this manga with that mindset. I was expecting it to deliver something deeper. So today I will be giving An Incurable Case of Love three stars, smack dab right in the middle between good and bad. This is just okay. <laughs> The second series we're diving into was a bizarre experience for me, and that's volumes one through four of Millennium Snow by Bisco Hattori. This is a supernatural romance shoujo. It's published by Viz Media and it's rated 13 plus. Now, I will mention that I've read volumes one and two of this series before, but when I reread them this month, it was like I was reading them for the first time. I don't think I've ever reread this series before, and I bought the first two volumes back in 2007, when this was first released. <laughs> the manga features a young woman named Chiyuki, a teenager with a congenital heart problem whose doctors estimate that she will not live to see the next snow. It also features a character named Toya, a vampire with the ability to keep a blood-bound partner alive for a vampire's entire lifespan, 1,000 years. After a chance encounter on the hospital grounds, Chiyuki finds out about Toya's secret and begs him to take her as his partner. Toya is... Toya or Toya? Toya is disgusted by blood and humans in general. He refuses Chiyuki, claiming that he will spend the next thousand years alone. Can Chiyuki persuade Toya to spend the next millennium with her before it's too late? This series is unique in that the first two volumes were released 10 years prior to the last two installments, so Hattori Sensei had to abandon Millennium Snow because of the overwhelming popularity of her breakout hit or in high school host club. In the side notes of the third and fourth volumes, 
<laughs> Hattori Sensei explains to readers that she decided to revive and finish the series not only to give fans closure, but to improve the overall story now that she felt more experienced writing and drawing manga. The story as a whole is a little all over the place. So in the first two volumes, uh, you're basically introduced to the characters. There are a couple of love triangles that are introduced into the volumes as well, but I'm happy to say that they were snuffed out quickly. <laughs> it's obvious these relationships would never have worked anyways, and it was just useless fluff in my opinion. I thought the story arc with Chiyuki's cousin K was super weird and out of the blue. He's supposed to be an older brother figure to Chiyuki, and the two are supposedly really close, which is cool except that he's insane. <laughs> I don't know, it was weird and confusing, and you wanna know something great? Hattori Sensei actually mentions that she regrets writing K this way in volume four. These little side notes were so cool, and I really appreciated reading her thoughts on things. The second two books were much better in my opinion. It was interesting reading Hattori Sensei's account of her struggle reviving the series. Apparently, it was really hard for her to reread the manga because she didn't like her old illustrations. She describes the whole experience as being similar to rereading your diary from junior high. I actually didn't think the art was too terrible until I saw the characters glow up and wow. Do they ever look good? <laughs> so up until the last half of the last volume, this manga was on the verge of becoming a four-star manga for me, despite the roughness of the first two volumes. We get to see some of Toya's relatives, we learn more of his backstory, and there's even an unexpected moment between our main couple. And then the ending happened and boy was it a doozy. <laughs> the ending of Millennium Snow is so confusing and so rushed that I still don't understand what happened and I read it twice. <laughs> Hattori Sensei introduces this new character. We have to learn everything about them. There's this huge conflict and everything goes to sh and it's all jam-packed in about 30 pages. And yes, I counted. <laughs> Fortunately, Hattori Sensei addresses this in the sidebar and explains that she planned a deeper, more detailed ending, but she had to cut a bunch of it and she did the best she could with the pages she had. If it's any consolation, I did like the last three pages, which include a little time jump. So there's that. <laughs> it wasn't a total loss. <laughs> As for the characters, I really liked both Chiyuki and Toya. Chiyuki's feelings towards Toya are very insta-love, but I can understand why. She doesn't want to die, and Toya is the key to life. Clinging to him, falling for him, could mean a thousand years of happiness for them both. Also, I liked that she's very blunt and upfront with her feelings. Chiyuki's teasing and playful jokes were hilarious, and I laughed quite a few times at this manga. It was way funnier than I thought it was going to be. Also, I cried during the last volume. Not at the end, but during some events before the end. I don't know if that means anything necessarily because I cry at everything, but I did find it emotional. So to wrap things up, this manga was okay. It was neat reading Hattori Sensei's first manga publication and then watching how much she transformed as a mangaka in 10 years. I really liked reading all of the commentary and it made the parts of the manga I disliked more tolerable because I had an explanation for why it was written that way. This series gets a total of three stars from me. The third manga we're going to talk about today is the Jose title. It's a big boy. <laughs> 
Haru's Curse by Asuka Konishi. This is a psychological drama romance manga and it's rated 16 plus. This manga was originally published into two tankobans, I think I pronounced that correctly, but when published into English by Vertical Comics, it was released in this omnibus format. When I first read this, I was unsure of how I felt about it, but having time to reflect and putting down my thoughts, that has made me recognize that I didn't mind this at all. The story follows Natsumi, an excitable yet charming woman who's always taking care of her younger sister Haru. Natsumi's devotion to Haru is extreme and borderline unhealthy, but she doesn't care because her sister is all she has in this world ever since their mother left and her father remarried. However, despite Natsumi's constant and loving care, her beloved sister passes away from an illness at the age of 19, leaving behind her family and her fiance Togo. Still recovering from Haru's death, Natsumi is approached by Togo, who asks if she wants to become his new girlfriend. Even though Togo and Haru's engagement was arranged by their parents, Natsumi is aware that her sister had feelings for Togo and that they were very genuine. Even so, Natsumi agrees to secretly date Togo, but on one condition, he has to take her to all the places he took Haru. I'm going to talk about the main thing that I didn't like about this story and just get it out of the way. I think this manga had some translation issues, but I only felt this while reading the dialogue during the serious conversations in the story. I won't spoil anything, but during these meaningful discussions, which also included triggering topics, the protagonist sounded unnatural to me. I kept thinking, no one talks like this. And it was jarring enough that it kept pulling me out of the story. Now, I only felt this way during these intense moments. The rest of the manga was fine in terms of the writing. So from the synopsis, I thought that this was going to be a bleaker story and although it touches on some darker themes, I didn't feel like it concentrated on that content as much. This is more a story of the main characters working through their loss, grief, and guilt while trying to understand their complicated feelings for each other. I really enjoyed the taboo nature of Natsumi and Togo's relationship. It was unique and interesting, and I don't think I've read a story with this kind of premise before. My favorite part in terms of the story was the ending. I absolutely loved it, and without spoiling anything, I'll just say that the ending surprised me, but in the best possible way. It ties everything together really nicely. I do wish there was one more volume or a sequel to the series because I want to follow the leads a little longer and see where life takes them. The characters in Haru's Curse are fleshed out, especially Natsumi's character. The thing I found fascinating about her was how she would switch back and forth between her gloomy and cheerful selves. I liked that Natsumi's happy-go-lucky personality wasn't a facade. There were just two sides of her and both were genuine. Togo is a quiet person who sort of reminds me of a robot but it makes sense to his character. He was born in a wealthy, privileged family and has never made decisions for himself. He just does what he's told. On his own, he'd be a fairly boring character, but Natsumi's goofy and loud personality plays off of Togo's perfectly, making the two a great comedic duo. <laughs> Konishi Sensei's art style features a lot of dark, bold lines with heavy black shading. It has a unique flair to it, which I can appreciate. There were some facial expressions that seemed a little out of place, usually in the more dramatic scenes, but overall I found the art refreshing. Haru's Curse is definitely one of the better short stories I've read recently, but I've been having a hard time putting a star rating to it. I think I'm going to give it a total of 3.5 seven, five stars. Almost a four star manga for me, but not quite. <laughs>
The fourth manga we're going to talk about today is one that my daughter picked up for me for Mother's Day because the cover is yellow. <laughs> and that's volume one of the Viz publication Fangirl. Based off of the best-selling YA novel written by Rainbow Rowell, the manga or graphic novel version of Fangirl was adapted by Sam Meggs and illustrated by Gabby Nam. For those that haven't read the novel, this is a comedy drama story with school life and slice of life themes. Recently, I found out that this is the first of four installments with the second installment being released in May 2022. I'm hoping we won't have to wait a year for every volume of this series because that would be a tragedy. <laughs> so Fangirl is about Kath a soon-to-be college student who's majoring in English and has a passion for writing fanfiction. Kath finds the college experience overwhelming. She feels uneasy sharing a room with a stranger. Her anxiety makes it impossible to enter the dining hall. And worst of all, her twin sister, Ren, is trying to discover independence and is pulling away from Kath. With her mental health in decline, Kath finds comfort writing her popular fanfiction about her favorite fantasy YA, the Simon Snow series. Will Kath be able to find a way to embrace and thrive at college? And what will she do when she learns that the professor of her writing class frowns on fanfiction? At first, I had a hard time reading this because it's read left to right and my eyes kept trying to read the panels backwards. But I got there in the end. It was tricky, but I got there. <laughs> I loved how relatable the story was. I think most people have been at a point in their lives where they feel truly alone. Kath has always had her twin sister to rely on, and it seems like Ren has been her main support system for her mental health up until now. So in a short amount of time, Kath is having to find a way to cope with her anxiety, manage the new college lifestyle, and also look out for her dad who seems to be suffering from empty nest syndrome. When I went to university, I moved to Waterloo, Ontario, which is roughly a 40 hour drive from where I live, and that's without stopping. <laughs> I was lucky enough to get my own room, but I didn't befriend any of my roommates or anyone really in my first semester. There was one time I didn't speak out loud for four days. College can be terrifying, and it was really easy to imagine what Kath was going through. It was interesting reading a manga set in the United States and that only made it more relatable to me because the environment was so familiar. I haven't read many manga about campus life in Japan, but even when Kath and Regan were eating spaghetti for dinner, or when Kath took a car ride home instead of the train. It was just so cool to see those Western experiences in a manga format. The characters in this manga are extraordinary. <laughs> I don't think there was a single character I disliked. My favorites though, by far, were Kath's roommate Regan and her boyfriend Levi. Regan is the opposite of a ray of sunshine and I love it. She's blunt and brutally honest, and that's exactly what our heroine needs after she's been struggling for months. Regan just asks Kath flat out if she has an eating disorder because she's been living on protein bars since the semester started. After talking with Kath, Regan realizes that she needs help figuring out the dining hall and the two end up eating meals together fairly regularly. Regan has this kind of tough love personality, but she didn't have to reach out to Kath. She chose to do so because she was worried and Kath could really use a friend. Also, she is the most beautiful character in this series so far. The face, those curves. Manga usually features the exact same body type, especially for female characters, so even the littlest, tiniest bit of diversity excites me. <laughs> the boys in this manga are cute, and I love that you can't tell whether <laughs> they're potential love interests or not, but I really liked Levi. 
He's a silly goofball with a caring heart and extrovert personality. For those that have read the manga or the novel, one of my favorite scenes was the dance party scene. I was grinning from ear to ear while I was reading that. <laughs> Even though Kath's love life is fairly non-existent up to this point, her Sam and Baz fanfiction is a BL dream. <laughs> her fanfiction is about the romantic relationship between Simon and his vampire bunkmate and rival Baz. It was fun to read the little cutaways and see what it was that Kath is actually writing. Apparently, Raoul wrote a spin-off novel called Carry On, which is essentially Kath's fanfiction. So I'm really hoping that we will get an illustrated version of that story as well. Lastly, I have to mention the art in this manga because it is so unbelievably beautiful. I applaud Gabby Nam for their amazing illustrations and art style. It might even be one of my favorite art styles that I've ever seen in manga and in graphic novels alike. It's just so well done. The characters all look different from each other and I appreciated that the characters had their own styles. Their expressions are flawless and you could really see their personalities through their actions and their mannerisms. This manga was really great. I just wish it had more content. This was like an introduction to the characters and the story, but we still haven't gotten to the meat and potatoes of the plot. <laughs> I decided to give this volume in particular 4.5 stars, but I have a feeling that once I've read more of the series, if it's similar in quality, it'll bump up to 5 stars. <laughs> The second last manga I'll be talking about that I read in the month of May was the autobiographical manga My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness by Nagata Kabi. This manga is published by Seven Seas Entertainment and it's rated 16 plus and it won the Harvey Award for Best Manga of 2018. My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness is a raw and honest autobiographical account of Kabi Sensei struggling with mental illness and queer sexuality. The entire book is about this person bearing their soul to you while chronicling their crippling bouts with depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and self-harm. They bluntly talk about their life falling apart, putting it back together, just to watch it fall apart again, Kabi Sensei carefully dissects these experiences in front of their audience through their illustrations and inner dialogue. Gradually, after looking within themselves and doing some research on mental illness, Kabi Sensei comes to the conclusion that a lot of their mental health issues stem from the fact that they are inexperienced socially. They yearn for unconditional love and acceptance the physical comfort of hugging another person and being hugged in return. This autobiography also reflects on how harmful it is to learn about sex and sexual communication through pornographic content such as yaoi. All of this is just the tip of the iceberg. I haven't even touched on all of the content in this manga. Kabe Sensei goes on to explain the pressures of, so of society <laughs> and one's parents, how mental health affects things like hygiene and creative output, and ultimately they describe their experience hiring a female escort. This book was extremely relatable and sort of eye-opening, and sometimes I felt like I was learning things about myself. Kabi Sensei has a talent of writing mental illness in a way that makes sense. The combination of their drawings and text allow them to explain and define what going through mental illness feels like. I can see a lot of people, including young people, benefiting from these definitions because sometimes you're unable to find the words yourself. It's the kind of narrative that works to start discussions about sex and mental illness to undo shame and build compassion. 
Just to wrap things up, I want to add that this book is more emotional and informational than scary. The minimalistic sort of chibi-esque art style helps lighten the subject matter in a way that's easy to consume and the light pink two-tone pages keep everything bright. All in all, this is a five-star manga for me and I think that everyone should read this manga as long as you can tolerate the subject matter. Be warned that Kabi sensei doesn't sugarcoat anything and they don't alter the narrative because something is too embarrassing or uncomfortable. This is a beautiful memoir of Nagata Kabi's general search for identity, self-worth, and happiness. I will be buying the rest of this series as soon as it's back in stock. <laughs> I saved my favorite thing I read this month for last. I talked about this in the commentary of my vlog and in my most recent haul video, and that's volumes one through three of the shoujo series QQ Sweeper by Kyosuke Motomi. Published by Viz Media, this shoujo paranormal rom-com is rated 13 plus and is actually a prequel series to the ongoing manga series Queen's Quality. I went into this manga with very low expectations because I'm not usually a fan of manga with with supernatural elements, but this won me over in just one volume. <laughs> in QQ Sweeper, Kyutaru, I hope I pronounce his name right, Horikata, is a teenage boy with a passion for cleaning and has been labeled the expert cleaner of Kurokado High by his classmates. His peers find him mysterious because he keeps his distance and is hard to approach. What no one realizes is that Kyutaru, nicknamed Q, which he hates, is a sweeper, and he cleans more than just the physical grime. As soon as a room becomes filthy, insects start to spawn, causing an infestation, infestation, <laughs> that threatens anyone who gets near. These aren't normal pests, but spirits that have the ability to enter a person's mind, feed off of people's negative thoughts, and if left unchecked, consume their minds. It's Q's job to eradicate these nasty insects and help repair what damage these pests have caused to people's mental health. One morning, while making his cleaning rounds, Q comes across a strange girl, transfer student Fumi Nishioka, sleeping in the abandoned building on school property. After accidentally showing promise as a sweeper, Fumi begins training under Q as his assistant by following him into people's subconscious, exterminating the infestations within their minds, and then cleaning these people's houses and rooms in the mundane world. Mundane? Mundane world. <laughs> I adore this manga so much. Not only does it deliver a strong introduction to an interesting concept for a supernatural story, its main and side characters are well-developed and the illustrations are remarkable. Motomi Sensei balances the romantic, mysterious, and thrilling elements of the story beautifully, and I felt that the pacing of this story was right on point. Even though the finale was open-ended to some extent, it's important to remember that this isn't the end of a series, but the birth of a bigger story. I cannot describe to you how much I loved the concept of this series. Just like a sweeper, I too have an affinity for cleaning. So watching our lead characters enter people's houses, help them sort their things from the trash and deep clean their environments to better their mental health made me tickled pink. <laughs> I admit, I have some issues with OCD and my anxiety is at its worst when my house is grubby, so I really relate to the messages that are conveyed in this story. The characters in this series get a standing ovation from me. I'm not going to stand, but you you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Q is probably one of the sweetest, grumpy manga boys I have ever read about, and he reminds me an awful lot of Jun Matsunaga in that he's a grump 
but he's still looking out for Fumi and he wants her to succeed. I loved that Motomi Sensei wrote Q as a believable teenage boy. He asks for help when he needs it and he's not afraid to ask questions. It was just so refreshing to see a teenager have an open dialogue with their adult guardians. However, this willingness to ask for support probably stems from the fact that sweepers need to have a healthy mind to do their job. Getting things off your chest and talking about your fears and voicing your concerns to others helps to keep your mind sane. There's one scene where Fumi has a nightmare and she can't get back to sleep. Q is so supportive of Fumi in this moment, offering her offering her comfort and suggesting she share her nightmare with him. It was so stinking cute! <laughs> also, I have to add that one of Q's guardians reminds me of Shigure from Fruits Basket. And I love that. I really love the female heroine in this story, and I might even like her more than Q, which is crazy because Q is such an amazing character but there's just something a little special about Fumi. <laughs> Fumi's ultimate goal in life is to marry a filthy rich prince and live happily ever after. At first, I thought she might be a homewrecker type of character, but early on in the story, we learn that she isn't about to get in the way of relationships and she isn't about to go for people already in love. I loved how goofy she was and how she had a passion for drawing portraits. Even though they look eerily similar to the Titans from Attack on Titan, <laughs> it's hilarious. I love that Fumi isn't feeble. She's dedicated and hardworking with a really positive attitude. Fumi also has this other side. She gets this face, this serious, badass, you can't with me face and wow it makes her look so cool <laughs> this other side of Fumi along with her very odd backstory really adds to the mysteriousness of her character and I'm excited to learn more about her before moving on I have to add that the chemistry between Fumi and Q is electric I would get so excited at the romantic moments that I would gush about them to my husband as they were happening, and he had no idea what I was talking about, but he listened nonetheless. <laughs> this is definitely my kind of romance. <laughs> Lastly, I need to briefly mention the art because it is phenomenal. The bugs are drawn in such a way that screams horror to me. They're so creepy and horrifying. <laughs> Motomi Sensei does such a great job capturing the mood of the moment in her illustrations. For example, the romantic bits are drawn very light and almost dreamy, while the action bits are intense with the character's actions and expressions reflecting those emotions. In summary, this manga really turned into one of my favorite series, and you guys probably aren't surprised that I'm giving it five stars. This has everything I could ask for in a romance shoujo series, and it even includes things I usually dislike in manga, which is why it's always important to try new things. I cannot wait to read Queen's Quality. <laughs> and with that, we have finally come to the end of May's manga wrap-up. If you've read any of these manga, I would love to know what you think. Let me know in the comment section below. Now, before I start my outro, I just want to let you guys know that I might combine June and July's wrap-ups. I'm leaving on a family vacation at the end of June, my daughter's birthday party is at the end of June, my sister is graduating this month, and my mom is getting married next month. I don't know what I'll end up doing, if I'm being honest, <laughs> but I wanted to give you guys the heads up, just in case. If you're interested in watching more videos from me, you can check out my end card where I'll have links to my most recent videos. I hope you all have a magnificent day and I'll see you in my next 
video. Bye!